All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chuck Curtis, and I'm here with Eric Myers. And together, we are the head instructors of the Sacramento Sword School. And while the fencing schools are closed, uh, we thought this would be a really good time to reach out to the community and host a series of Distrezzo lectures. What we didn't expect was how popular these lectures would be and the impact that they could have on community building uh, right now. I think we're all in a really challenging time. Um, so really pleased to see everybody here. I want to welcome everybody. Um, we had about 50 people on the last lecture and another 200 watched it uh, online. And we have similar numbers for tonight, and we'll try to record this video and post it uh, in the same way. Uh, with that, um, I want to introduce Sean Reichman. Sean's been fencing for about 20 years and teaching for about 10 years, and he is one of the founders of the Brisbane School of Iberian Swordsmanship, which has been active for about five years. It's one of the largest historical martial arts schools in Australia and one of the larger distressed schools in the world. Uh, since I've met him, I've been consistently impressed with the school's can-do, uh, positive approach, their values, and their work building a community of Destreza practitioners. And the thing about this lecture that I think is really going to be interesting for a lot of us, uh, there are plenty of talented people in the United States and elsewhere who are finding their stride in this tradition and could be ready to begin teaching or opening their own school, but maybe they miss the critical element that Sean has found uh, with BSIS. So uh, with that, I'm going to get out of his way. And uh, do we have any questions? First, we should probably try to establish his background a little bit. So um, Sean, uh, talk to us about um, your, your fencing history a little bit. Okay, um, well, first I'll talk so that my screen comes up and they get to see my handy little printout that shows us where we are in the world. Um, uh, I'm one of the lead instructors and founders of Brisbane School of Iberian Swordsmanship, as Puck said, and it opened its doors in 2015 in Queensland, Australia. On the opening night, we had 30 people using swords, and by the end of the first year, we'd had uh, 40 members for that year. In 2019, we're up to 56 members and we've been maintaining 50% of our membership year on year. Uh, the other founders of the school were Sharon McHugh and Kate Hickey. We had a lot of help from um, Hannah Hickey as well, right from the beginning as a pedagogy coach. And as we moved into virtual teaching in virtual swords, she assures me that people can focus and learn better if they can see their face of the person talking. So that's why today you get to see my face regardless of how I feel about my social isolation here or not. Um, and I should start with a little about me, which Puck led into. So uh, I'm 46 and I learn, earn a living as a software developer. I started playing with swords in a group in about 2000 and it was about 2009 that I put on a fencing mask. Uh, I met Sharon through fencing and in 2012 we got married. It was very quick. I want to say thanks to Puck and Eric for having me on today and giving me a chance to talk about this and uh, share what I can and the joy for the school that I hold, I guess, is really what I'm sharing today. And uh, when I first floated the idea of talking about it, I was a bit more like, really, don't we just want to talk about Figgy Buckler? But <laughs> one of the values of this is, is letting people do what they're good at. And I know Puck is really good at reading the community and knowing what it needs. So I'm yeah quite willing to go with what he's doing. I also think it's great value to everyone, whether they're just starting out and trying to choose a school to fence at, or whether they're at a stage where they might be starting to want to produce their own districts. Is that uh, to know how schools could be run or how schools are being run. Um, okay, I'm going to keep looking down, which is challenging, but anyway, limited time to prepare and all that. Uh, today, basically, I'm going to say three things. The first one is don't do it alone. 
uh, enable people to do what they're good at and really realize that swords are for everyone and make sure you build your school to ensure that can happen. Uh, I've got a plan, a set out of notes of where we want to, where I want to go with this talk today, but I normally find that input from the others helps steer it and we get a better end result. So please raise your questions through the chat and uh, Puck and Eric can escalate them. Voice. Because as I so said earlier, actually see the chat. Yep. I'm going to jump in with a quick question there. So you said um, that you want your school to be a place where students can train or where they're welcome. Can you, are you going to delve into that a little more or, or is that something that you want to address right now? Absolutely. Um, I think I'll leave that a little bit later on, but yeah, it's, uh, I think that's key to how we maintain our numbers too. So there's a lot of how to get people into the school, but how to keep them there and keep them coming back is to do with that. Um, the uh, yeah, making them feel welcome and feel valued as part of uh, the thing that you're doing. Um, okay, so I think I'll just move on to how we got started or where it all started really. In the beginning, so in about 2011, I made it over to a WMAW and that was amazingly eye-opening. So that's the Western Martial Arts Workshop, in case people don't know. And uh, there was presenters from all different areas and all sorts. Um, one of the guys that I was traveling with was going, oh, this Puck guy is really good, we've got to go to his class. And before that, I'd never actually heard of Puck at all, but we did go to his class and he was really good fundamental to changing my way of uh, seeing the world and seeing fencing and it was really something that I was taken by. Not only that, but he presented the workshop so very well. He was engaging, he um, yeah, presented everything. I probably don't need to tell everybody here how much, um, yeah, how good Puck is. I did get accused of having a man crush on Puck when we got back to Australia. I think that's, that's probably pretty true. Um, so just just a quick warning, not not about the man crush, which I totally accept and, and I cherish. Um, videos dropping out a little bit. Um, so um, mo mostly I'm getting it uh, sometimes your videos dropping on your side. So uh, if there's a visual aid that you hold up, uh, we'll try to let you know if we can't see it, okay? Okay. So at least audio is still coming through, yeah? Audio is consistently good. Excellent. Um, okay, yeah, in the next couple of years, I got over to a few more workshops of Pugs and various other things. This was when I also did a workshop with Tim, and he convinced me that maybe the stuff before the True Art was actually could be fun as well. So hence the broader name for the school and the broader topics that we cover. Uh, we primarily teach LVD, but in the later grades, we branch out to cover more topics and do more interesting things. Uh, at the same time, the HEMA scene in Australia was really starting to take off again, revitalize, whatever we want to call it. It was probably key around uh, a national tournament that ran in 2009 that was organized by a local school, Vanguard. And that brought people from a few different states over in and got everything going again. Uh, in the following years, I spent a lot of time uh, organizing social fencing events between the various schools. We'd often have days in the park where we'd come and fence. We had an informal social wasters tournament where it would be run on stats. So people that turned up each month uh, could calculate and compare. And at the end of the year, we had the person that died the least. And uh, yeah, so on a kill death ratio, really, I was happy when I made it past 50%. Anyway, um, so by early 2015, I was training with multiple groups and I had really started to decide that Estreza was the thing that I wanted to do. And there didn't seem to be anybody else in Australia doing it that I could find. Um, I had a passion for Estreza and Sharon had a passion for getting things done. So she went out and wrote a mission statement, started to find what we're going. And I think two days later, she had this amazing logo. Um, yep, 
maybe it wasn't two days later, but it was very early in the piece. Uh, I'm talking a bit slower now, so that just in case the audio can catch up, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> excuses. Um, so can you talk I, a little bit about uh, what it was that your interest in Destreza was brought about by? Was it just uh, scene puck or the reading or something like this? How did you how did you pick this as a thing to focus on? Um, I think it was because it was uh, the one that I enjoyed the most. I found that the considered approach to thinking about your actions before you take them and the um, uh, upright, relaxed stance was a problem, um, was very, very good for me personally. Uh, uh, through the other fencing styles, uh, nerves, twitch, timing things, if I'm like uh, a tempo fencer, which is probably what I use for most of the other ones, then it tends to feed into nerve issues and that. I'd much rather be uh, slow, considered, controlling the blade, controlling the fight. So you know, that's probably the angle that got me into Destrezza. There, there was also, uh, yeah, well, Man Crush on Puck certainly helps. And um, the general Spanish history and so forth that was around that. It was really good. And there was a little bit of that nobody else was teaching it, so I couldn't get into enough detail to know whether it, what, what it was like or how it held up or what it was doing. So I was keen for that. So I, I have a question about something that you had said previously. Um, sure. You talk about organizing um, community tournaments. So it sounds like um, Organizing the community was something that you were doing well before um, you put the school together. Is that something that fed into your efforts? Did it influence how you did this? Uh, yes, certainly. So uh, I wouldn't say I was organizing the community. I was just certainly active in it, right? So sometimes uh, a focal point, all they need is, hey, let's do this thing Wednesday, or I'd be the one that would like, take the stats from the weekend and put it in a spreadsheet and put it up. Uh, so it's just sort of that, that enabling and supporting, and I'd be the one prompting people. It's like, hey, you're coming again this week? Hey, you've got to get your start up. And I think it's just because I like people. <laughs> Interestingly, I'm an incredibly shy person, so I put off teaching fencing for a very long time because it was not something that I wanted to do at all. Um, but I got over it. Uh, so yeah, building the community, uh, long before I knew I needed a community, I was very involved. I was uh, yeah, branching out, crossing the schools, making sure that everybody knew everybody and creating a good social environment. So, I have a follow-up question on that too, Sean. Um, is the community that you're referring to, is that really mostly schools or are there like society fencers like SCA or other reenactment groups or something? What's the predominant, um, I guess, milieu that that these fencers um, typically spend the time in? Yep, uh, so it is pretty much all HEMA schools. There's a uh, uh, school of historic defense arts, which I was training with, which is run by Henry Fox Walker, who uh, was also training with the SCA. So there's a lot of support and crossover in there, but not so much directly with the SCA. So Henry set up that school so that he could get more fencing time, essentially, and uh, still had close ties with the SCA. Uh, it wasn't until after uh, after business was running that I really had much to do with the SCA. So yeah, most of the others are established groups that are around here. There's a lot of longsword and uh, a lot of the Italian sort of or Elizabethan fencing. Did we just lose part? No, no, I'm, I'm still here. I'm, I'm just listening, um, and I, I don't have anything to add. I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you. Um, I think um, all of this is interesting. So I, I want to let's let's keep going forward. I think you answered my question pretty well. Okay, cool. I was just worried about the funny feed wiggles. I'm getting all over the place. Um. Okay, so the mission statement that Sharon put down was. Wanting to instruct and do bowing in scholars' privilege and mass dueling with a focus on safety, historic accuracy, martial effectiveness, and honorable conduct. 
So uh, these are pretty broadly what you'd hope you find in a fencing school anyway. So I can see why they're still carrying on today. And you'll note that we list safety first. So yep, that's that's pretty on par with what's going on in the world. From that point, uh, working from page to practice and what I can remember of the workshops that I've done, I went through continuing to teach myself um, LVD and Kate heard about my endeavors and she convinced her nephews to get me to teach them LVD in two days while they were on holidays from another country. So I did, I gave it a shot. They, they certainly had fun and were engaged with the swords and so forth. This convinced me that I could transfer my knowledge and that uh, teaching a school would certainly be uh, what I'm after. Okay, at some point that year, Kate found herself without a school to fence at. So she became my first ongoing student and she very quickly changed into helping me arrange the syllabus so that we could uh, teach people that hadn't engaged with SOARS before. Uh, this was when Hannah also taught me how to put together a lesson plan and I started to flesh out the first two grades of what the school would teach. And Sharon went into a full collateral production. She started doing Facebook presence and uh, intro blurbs and um, vision statements and finalizing the logo to where it is now. Okay, the grades in this is, um, we've set them up to ensure that everybody gets a lesson appropriate to their skills. So there's no, uh, there's no authority granted by your ranks. There's no social standing given by the ranks. It's purely there as a marker of where you are in the business progress of things. Um, and yeah, you'll see that there's the reoccurring effect of not limiting people's contributions or their content dependent on their rank within the school. That, seems to be a trap that devalues a lot of people. Uh, okay, so. So before you move on on that one, I think that's an interesting statement. I, could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, because it's, I think that's a point of difference from the way that some schools do things. And I wanna kind of get a deeper take on it. Yep, certainly. Um, what am I saying? So we've got three or four grades or, or whatever, and you'll say, oh, you can only be an instructor once you reach the fourth grade. And this seems to be a fairly arbitrary um, selection process. And it's basically, oh, what do you need to do to be that instructor? Okay, do you have those skills? We can do it, good. Um, it also means that when we're organizing social events or activities or whatever, it's not like, oh, we need this grade to help out, or these people are the only ones that are going to do it. It's basically, to the whole school, it's like, we're doing this thing, please come help us do it. Uh, what skills do you want to bring? What what tasks do you want to do? What is it that you can contribute? So it's, uh, yeah, once again, that collaborative approach to everybody uh, having, having value to add to what's going on. Thank you. That's good. I should have used that time to read my next note. Damn. Sean, uh, wait, wait, question uh, from someone about how much, how much of your time outside of your full-time job does uh, running your school take? But it also sounds like maybe you have an awful lot of, of uh, volunteering that goes on uh, from members of the school. Is that accurate? Or is, do you distribute yeah. that load fairly well? Or do you still have a, a really uh, time-intensive role outside of your normal job? Uh, it's still pretty time intensive, but it can be not be. So there's times where it's more so and times when it's less so. Certainly in the first few years where I was constantly building a syllabus and uh, refining our grading process and all those things, I was very much more engaged. But basically I, I was doing all my fencing administration work on a bus to and from work. So. 45 minutes to an hour and a half each day. And uh, since the COVID thing, I've sort of been at home for that. So that's all gone away. And yet most of the things that I need to do have still progressed. Um, also valued by the fact we're not actually running classes. Uh, we have a fortnightly 
administration team meeting. So we do that on Thursday evenings for about two hours, and that's where we'll flesh out the next two weeks of what the school's going to do, who's going to teach what. Uh, we address any of our feedback, and we address um, yeah coming events and so forth. Other than that, the outside time tend to be when we're having events or displays on the weekends and so forth. But yeah, basically it's just that Wednesday evening and then Saturday mornings we do some fencing in the park. Everybody's got a spitting cycle on it. That does not look good for me. You're back? Uh, you never did drop out in audio, so I can hear everything you're saying. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's still a lot of time, but it's also structured, so it doesn't have to be me doing those things. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit more in a little bit too. Okay, so our, our syllabus is set up so that in the first grade, you basically get a more or less one-on-one -on -one, uh, lesson, and we have a dedicated instructor for that any week. So people just drop in whenever they're ready and whatever they want to do. And that just basically takes them through, as I said, the safety and structure, what to expect, and uh, gives them an entire line thrust, which is all, and I mean very loosely, an entire line thrust, which is all they need to go into our next grade, which is our first official grade, which is uh, a cycle of uh, lessons. All of our lessons are cyclic, so we have, uh, like there's eight lessons in the first grade and they all cycle through and you come back to the same lesson. Uh, the first grade is complicated by the fact that there's new people dropping in at any stage. So much as our lessons have a specific focus for each one of the evenings, they also build on uh, the skills from the previous or next and give you the things that you need to get through and have fun. Um, this. This also allows in the later grades that we can have drop in and drop out members. So we understand that fencing is a hobby. So we can't expect everybody to turn up every time on every night. And we ensure there's no penalty for being away for any length of time and there's no barrier of re-entry. Uh, we reflect this in our group on group lesson cards have no expiry date. If you find one in the drawer two years later, you can go, oh, I'll pop back in and get these last two lessons that are on my card. So you re-engage and um, come back to what's going on. Uh, from a syllabus development point of view, the, the first grade is designed to get the student playing basically a fencing chess game. So they've got the limited set of moves that they've learned in class and they need to be executing them in a competitive way, semi competitive way. Uh, this is normally our scholars privilege system where we can also use a lot lower safety gear and it's very controlled and it's it's that uh, strategic game and getting people to think about their actions before they take them um, that is the goal for that lesson. Can you With the drop uh, in, drop out. No, I can still hear you but um, can you um, briefly describe scholars privilege uh, bouting? Actually, okay. uh, in the in your answer, Sean, can you also talk a little bit about how long uh, it typically takes a student to to get to a certain level? Um, so we have a sense of like I don't know how many hours, days, a week, years, whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. So I think you're you're generating a, a large stream of questions in the chat. I think people are engaged with what you're saying. Uh, we're going to pace those questions a little bit, everybody. Um, but feel free to keep asking. And we have some of the leadership team from. BSIS in the chat as well, and they're, they're fielding some of these questions. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Puck, what was your question? I've gone from my head. So we have two questions. The first one is, uh, can you describe uh, the scholar's privilege bouting? And uh, Eric's question was, can you talk about uh, time between ranks and uh, what that sort of um, forward progress is like as far as time scaling? Okay, so uh, scholars privilege, uh, basically we stole the name from some random English treaties reference thing. I think it was a tradition in England possibly where they had a fencing system where they wouldn't stab at the head. 
think Saviola gives the English shit for training in this way and the artifacts that it produces in their fencing. Um, it's true. It produces those artifacts in our fencing too. So <laughs> it's something to be mindful and good to know. But in essence, we've got very low gear, uh, competitive environment where we work to train the skills that we've done. So this is done at the slowest speed needed by either of the combatants to be able to make conscious choice about their next decision. So this is much calmer version of our combat. And um, it's certainly an artificial competition. No one goes, oh, I feel wonderful. I have won that scholar's privilege. No, it's much more like, oh, I managed to do the techniques that I worked. Oh, that technique does not fit in that spot. I should not be trying to put that there. And um, that, that sort of approach to it is what it's for. It starts at a very base level. And as I say, it's really great when uh, people have low gear or there's uh, lots of people that get a bit claustrophobic or weirded out by masks. So it gives them a chance to play a competitive game and be involved in things as well. Um, so, and that uh, progresses through all the levels. Sorry, I, I, we're in danger of speaking over each other whenever we're doing a chat like this. but. Um, somebody in the chat mentioned the Carranza Cup uh, and briefly oh, yeah. talked about what it was. I wonder if you could talk about that in this context a little bit. Um, okay, so Carranza Cup is part of our community building and uh, something that is incredibly on brand for our business school. It's basically a tournament that we run where we exclude the top 25 fighters from the nation. So the top 25 are not allowed to enter, everybody else does. The idea is to encourage beginners. We normally have a level cap. If we ever get enough beginners that that level cap is reached, we'll start um, taking out the more experienced members. Uh, to make this work, we have a boss fight. So of those 25 that we've um, precluded from entering, we invite them back as boss fights. So we normally get, uh, three to five of these boss fights to come and help the school and support that tournament. And basically everybody that enters, they get one fight against one of these boss fights and uh, the bosses just can't progress in the tournament. So they're there purely to help uh, encourage new blood and let people have a feel of like uh, what the upper end of tournamenting is as well as get in there and uh, do their tournament. We also use it for a uh, time to practice marshalling and refing. So in this one, everybody has to ref their bout that's two ahead of their bouts. So you get some, um, people that have really never ever done marshalling before and suddenly they have to get up there, and be trying to track the fight and um, do things. Some people find they like it, some find they hate it and it's not to them. And this is really that time to make you uh, Give it a go and see how it goes. So, yeah. All right. I keep I keep derailing you, uh, but it's just a fascinating topic. And the Carranza Cup. I don't know if you were planning on talking about it, but it sounded really interesting. I love how you have got yeah. it systematized as a, a sort of a a way to build up students and give them a chance to test themselves. Um, but I've also uh, blocked you from answering Eric's question about time between ranks, so I want to pivot back to that. Okay, before we quite go back to that, in the Carranza Cup, uh, we have a prize called Pacheco's Best and Fairest. And I'm like, if there's any audience that's going to get that as the joke, it's sort of like this one. Surely, surely we can have a place in Destreza for that. And also, points back to Pucks. Yeah, almost all the nerdy Destreza jokes are not that very funny. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, an, an ironically named Pacheco prize uh, is um, pretty funny. Good. We certainly like it. Uh, okay, so Eric's progression thing. Um, once again, it depends on it depends on the person a lot. So for our grading systems, we never have like an invitation or uh, you know you must be noticed or whatever. It's basically we have some rules that which you have to meet to be able to be assessed, and then you just get to assess. So I find that's an important way to avoid any favoritism or any people getting left behind or anything else. It's like, have you attended all of the eight lessons of this novice class? Then, yep, you're good to give it a try. 
and all of our assessment is documented and uh, we give written feedback to the students at the end of that. So even if they don't get through, they know exactly what it is that they need to work on and where things are. And we then have a stock of these that we can make sure that we've got a consistent and comparable assessment system, which uh, takes a lot of work, especially to get started. But now after four years, we're starting to um, get a much better flow of that. So for the admin work, um, the, the higher grade assessments is probably the one that takes me the longest. So very quickly, I managed to hand off as much of the lower assessments as I could to the other instructors. I mean, I got them to volunteer to help out with the assessments, so that offloaded that. But yeah, one of our other goals is making timely feedback. And there has certainly been a few occasions where some of the assessment has gotten derailed by normal life and it's not been timely. Uh, but these are all goals. So we're working towards it and trying to get it done. Uh, what are we going? Okay, eight weeks. So if you attended eight weeks, then you can assess. The other option is if you've studied distresses somewhere else and we have a reasonable field that you would have the knowledge that's needed to assess, then you can get a assessment by prior learning, is basically what we call it. So um, we just run it through that way. Normal person off the street, we suggest they need at least two cycles. So we're looking at 16 weeks for that first uh, lesson. Uh, this is still surprisingly different for a lot of people. It's not just like if they're super athletic and they turn up, they can do it in eight weeks, or it's like if they're studying at home, work manuals and so forth as well, then they'll do it too. If they've um, had other sort of experience that can either help them or slow them down, it, it can go either way. Um, yep, and the next, the next grade we try to include all the single sword content for um, basically what page to practice or what I could get out of page to practice to teach. And that's a bit longer. I think it's a 12 week cycle and we definitely need people to do two cycles of that. Um, it takes a lot more time to pick that up and it's a lot more, uh, you need to spend a lot more time practicing the actions in the combat too. How's that going, Eric? That's good. I think that's a good answer. Yeah, thanks. We're going to try to stop derailing you for a little bit. The chat is um, still pretty active, uh, but your, your legion of helpers uh, and uh, co-founders are all in there. Which is a great demonstration of business, right? We're here to talk about business, and we've got all these members of business here doing it. It's not just all about me, which is what I love about the school and what we're constructed. Uh, okay, well, the next thing I was going to talk about was the pedagogy and policies document, which is was created very early on in the piece by the four of us. We basically got together and described what it was that we wanted uh, to be the fencing environment where we'd want to train. Uh, it basically boiled down to treating students as adults, so we're primarily adults or certainly functionally capable individuals. and um, that everybody that turns up with prior knowledge, prior um, experience, and that can be relative, um, can be valuable and should be rewarded. Um, okay, so at the time we were training under training, Sharon and I were training at the School of Historic Defense Arts with Peter Fox Walker, and um, he was very supportive of our endeavors. He, he helped us out with insurance and a lot of the documentation that we need to get the school up and running. He has been invaluable in getting us started. So, uh, yeah, certainly look at working in conjunction with your existing schools when if you're trying to start your own school. Henry provided another thing that we value in the system, which was accountability. So basically, Henry was a point that any member of BISIS could escalate problems or things that weren't going as they expected, and I'd have to listen. So um, it's building in fail safes to our system. So yeah, sure, I'm a nice guy, but the next person may not be. So uh, yep. One of the other things that we build in for accountability is we have a student well-being officer or happiness officer, as we call them for short. So we're often 
told that it sounds a little bit like telling people to be happy. But anyway, um, so uh, the student wellbeing officer is outside the admin team. They're elected by the student body and essentially they volunteer to advocate for anybody that needs any help or anything's going on in school or um, yeah, don't want to voice things directly to any of the admin team. They also so do this, some more pleasant things. Yeah, I just have a question. So this sounds a little bit like you have um, two different ombudsmen help um, with inter-school or in-school issues. Is that what I'm getting out of that? Yep, that's essentially the idea of it. And um, so talk about the motivation that put that into place. I, you know, without detailing any specific names. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm curious, why, why did you guys feel that was necessary and what's the benefit that you get out of it? Um, okay, so it's about exclusion, being left behind, uh, being discriminated against and generally uh, treated unfairly in a social event. So this is, is a not-for-profit organization. I'm not sure if I made that clear yet, but uh, there's no ultimate point is trying to make all the monies or anything else. So it's just a collaborative group of people working together and we need to make sure that everybody that comes into it and contributes to it has the same sort of standing and same ability and um, is treated fairly and uh, yeah, is not uh, discriminated against uh, either in your official sort of race, sex, gender, that sort of things, or just in the not being marked for assessments or being uh, unfairly harassed by instructors or I, I harassed by other students. Um, yeah, that sort of stuff. So um, I guess it's the martial arts meme, your McDojos and so forth that sort of have that kind of uh, system in their history and so forth and we felt that that was important to uh, make sure that couldn't be part of our, our way of life. Sean, how do you, how do you uh, bring in the, the, the culture of questioning and everything from, from Destreza and tie that into culture of your school? It seems like there's a certain amount of, of similarity in there right where you're trying to have um, investigation transparently and discussions about them. Is that something that you draw specific connections to or can you maybe talk about this a little bit more? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes is the short answer to that. Um, it certainly, uh, it feeds well to the way I think. So I think that was probably also something that drew me to Distreza. And uh, I don't just mean the way I think about fencing. It's the way I think about life in general. So friends would might be pleased, I would hope. And um, that's the same thing in running our class too. We don't tend to have classes where it's like, do this exactly like this because. It's like, why, why are we making these choices? What is that? Why is fingernails up bad? What, what are its weaknesses? Are there times where it's not bad and can be good? And um, so we have that through our lessons. So, uh, and our instructors draw that out with class interactions and participation. So we also hope that uh, brings through to the social side of um, yeah, what we're doing and how things happen. We tend to be a lot more public with our discussions and the admin teams and so forth. A lot of the times you'll get people that just turn up to fencing and it's like, I just want a fencing school. Why, why am I being involved in all these things that you're saying? And they're free to ignore us if they want, but some people are like, oh, this is great. I get to see what's going on and how the process is there and what things are coming along next. Uh, yep, completely derailed. What was I thinking about? <clears throat> Do you feel like uh, you have students who are like overwhelmed by the amount of information that you, you give them in terms of context um, or feel like you found a balance of giving uh, like beginners a certain amount of information and keeping open uh, the conversation as they get more experienced? Yeah, so um, no. What I've found is people 
are amazingly keen for context and detail. It's it's stunned me how much and how interested they'll be at it constantly. Like I'm very much uh, talk for a little bit, do a thing. Talk for a bit, do a thing. Like um, it's the way I react better. It's the way that I've seen um, things generate fencing and so forth. But a lot of the time, people just want to talk about the details of how this thing is there and what it is that it's come from and which manual it's from and what this text is and far more than I ever expected they would. So um, in essence, the syllabus is structured so that we have a fast changing balance between uh, context and theory and doing and actions and applying those theories. Each instructor uh, has some freedom in teaching those lessons the way they want to. And some have a higher focus on the theory and some have a higher focus on the physical side. And it's usually down to just reading the class and seeing where they want to go, which yeah, more and more is a lot more uh, theory than I ever thought they would want at uh, come do some fencing on once a week, one and a half times a week. Did I get to the point there, Eric? Yes, that was great. Thank you. Cool. Um, so accountability, happiness officers. Yep. Uh, no more questions about them. Cool. Oh, yeah, so with Shooter having provided a leg up and everything on board, we were pretty much about ready to go with one slight complication that Sharon was eight months pregnant. Um, so there's a little bit about how, how are we going to run this? Are we going to do it while she's pregnant? Whatever. Anyway, so it turned out D'Artagnan was born on the 28th of October and we opened the school on the 2nd of December. So it's like just over a month after Dart was born is our opening night and we've got everything going. Uh, there were certainly a few people there on opening night that had just come for the baby cuddles and that was great too. Uh, yeah, and a lot of the other people that came were people that I built friendships with through the community and all the payback for this uh, union and uh, cohesion that I tried to work on long before I ever knew that was something that I needed in school. It's just because I liked fencing with these people. Um, there were about a third of the people that turned up that were there purely from Facebook uh, word of mouth and just the limited number of flyers that we gave out. Uh, so yeah, that certainly showed that the market in Brisbane had not yet been saturated, even though there are quite a few schools um, going on in there. I'll just pause for a minute to see if there's any questions. We've got a couple of questions uh, coming up. Uh, first one, uh, classes for, for children, do you host classes for kids? No. <laughs> When, when we launched, we had a minimum age of 16. And once we realized that meant we needed working with children documentation anyway, uh, we dropped that to 14. And at the moment, we basically put 14 on our flyers, but it's like anyone that's physically big enough and strong enough to hold a sword for the lesson time, we, we teach. So there's no specific kids' classes, but we certainly uh, are much more flexible in the age range. Um, so yeah, there's another group in Brisbane um, run by Ross Davies who has a very big focus on on kids' classes and keeps trying to get that off the ground. But uh, he has trouble converting parents into enthusiasm into actually bringing their kids to things. But he has uh, foam saws and really wonderful at working with kids. Uh, I've helped him out at a few of the displays at our uh, bigger areas, and I'm just amazed at his uh, tolerance, maybe, maybe that's the word, ability to work with the children and get them to do really cool things. You have them doing unicorn guards and uh, yeah, right from the kick. -in. Anyway, so we take younger students, we don't have a kids class. Good, thank you. Okay. Uh, so now I just wanted to delve into some of these principles that I keep talking about and uh, if Lois has already shared the link to the pedagogy document, if not, we'll do it after the meeting. Um, 
So one of our first ones is democracy. So I've kind of implied that throughout a few different things. But basically, we have a very flat hierarchy. We have the admin team and we have the school. And decisions are made by one of those two bodies. There's a little bit of a line split as to where those decisions come and go. And usually it's like the whole school or anything that's spending large amount of funds or affecting the whole school and the admin team just take care of the boring day-to-day -day stuff of um, you know, getting stuff done. Um, there's no head of school, there's no special treatment for founders, and there's no authority by rank. So once again, it's that very much everybody is equal, everybody has things to contribute, everybody can help out as much or as little as they want to. Uh, anything that the admin team is conducting, the happiness officers are invited to come along. So they just basically get that out external independent view to make sure that the admin team is serving the interests of the student body as well. Once again, I mean, I trust us, but who knows where that could possibly go. So building in the infrastructure to prevent problems. I'm also a really big uh, believer in self-organizing systems. And if everybody knows what the outcome is that we're after, then they can help in their own specific way in the best way they can. This is a concept that's made Kate really nervous, but after almost five years of it, I think she's starting to accept it. Okay. So the next one is humility and uh, so basically, this comes across in a few different ways, but the one that I like to talk about is when I was writing the lesson plans, I always said that I was focusing on being obsolete as quickly as possible. So this was just generally so that the school was not dependent on any one person. Um, yeah. So we're trying to establish that and that allows us to take nights off, or at least in theory we could. And we've had instructors go on long service leave, we've had them have babies, uh, but the truest test of this was when Kate was sick for about a year. And um, yeah, that, that way things well. So Kate's a trained accountant, and more horrifyingly, she likes keeping records and filling in forms. So if you have a Kate, get them to help out. I mean, by get them to help out, I probably just mean tell them they can, and they're just going to go for it. Um, so that was great until she was suddenly not doing the millions of different things that she had been doing. And we had to uh, scramble around and collect up those and start distributing them more fairly, or uh, more manageably across multiple volunteers. We also spent the time uh, splitting out what was definitely mandatory, had to be done every week, and what other things could be let slide for months at a time. And some of the things that were like really nice to have if you've got a Kate, but if you don't got a Kate, yeah, that's one thing we don't have to do. So uh, this also forced us to document a lot of our processes. And once again, this makes it easier for people to swap in and out and have different people pick up where they were and uh, not vulnerable to losing any one member of the school will keep going. Um, and I, have a, I have a question about this. It seems like like you're describing um, two things which are are I don't know almost in opposition to me. It seems like you had a really good plan for how things were going to run at the beginning, um, but then you uh, you got more people involved like later to do things, and when they couldn't make it, then you got more of your process documented and and whatnot. So how do you transition from a smaller group to a larger group? I mean, in terms of what you can do and how you get people, how 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 big or small was your initial group compared to where you are today? Yeah, so the initial group was still quite big. So we had about 15 or 20 people. And in those early days, that was the one class or two classes. So um, they were fairly big for classes and the admin structure was much smaller. So Kate and I started as, as the instructors and basically she'd teach the beginning class and I'd teach apprentice for one cycle and then we'd swap over and do the others. Um, once we progressed past that, we very quickly started to pick up 
uh, volunteers that were willing to instruct or otherwise previously experienced able to help out with that. And I think Ron was our first instructor that we brought on board and then uh, Lois and as, as we got more students and more classes and started to see that we needed more uh, people to cover these different, these isolated classes. So the, um, the advantage of, uh, the drawback of giving everybody a class suited to their skill level is you need to be able to break those skill levels up and have somebody teach those things. So um, yeah, and uh, once again, it was as soon as possible, we brought on people to uh, cover redundancy. So in that very, very early stage, there was no way that Kate or I could have a night off. It, uh, I think, yeah, usually Sharon was running the very beginner class too. Um, what was I saying? And yeah, so how did we transition from the small group to the bigger group? Slowly. I, I think it, it's we adapted as we went. So for Intuitively, the skill of some of our students progressed at the same sort of speed that the size of the school increased and we got more content. So we were able to draw on more members that were enthusiastic and wanted to join in to become instructors and part of the admin team and get things done. And um, yeah, then bigger. So what were we talking about? The vulnerability of the paint. Yeah, so like I say, um, it's not so much that we had a good plan at the start and then it started to fall apart as we got bigger. It was simply that we started doing it and things collected. They all collected with Kate. So at some point we had to recognize that and that her being ill was that point that pushed us all to go, oh, this is actually what we need to be doing to be running this school. And that pushed it out into documentation and sharing the load so I'm not sure Kate hasn't just taken it all back over once you come back. So it sounds to me like there's a tension uh, in this between democratization of effort and expertise. So how do you balance that? So some people will know the tradition better or um, perhaps there's a conflict in the school about the way a technique should be done. How do you resolve that? Um, in light of both these sides of this position, democratization of effort and expertise in the tradition. Yep, so uh, this is why I'm one of the lead instructors, right? Because we have more than one. Uh, so it's the same sort of thing. Basically, first run through, I had free reign. Essentially wrote the syllabus and put things out as they were. And this, this is the teachings. Um, which anybody that deals with school knows that that was still fairly loose and each of the instructors were able to uh, teach the plans in their own ways, but it came down to the content was uh, the same. And how does that change over time? So obviously we know we're gonna make mistakes. In fact, I'm pretty sure we made a few in um, you know the first couple of weeks. But uh, that tends to be treated like most of the things in the school, it's, there's a, um, the suggestion for a change and then that's escalated up into the vote and if there's enough people that want it then it um, will usually become part of the syllabus but Kate and I are sitting as gatekeepers which is basically you've got to convince one of us that that's the way that syllabus should be taught or um, or it doesn't change and it's a little bit like that too if we can't um, convince each other that it should be changed, then it'll stay the way it is until there's a better argument for it. Sean, we have a, a couple of questions here. Um, seems like the curriculum is still uh, a little eclectic and there's there's some trying to pull some sort of uh, uniformity in it. Can you talk about this a bit more? Are, are your instructors, do they, are they encouraged to delve deeper into particular sources um, and, and teach that? Or do you, want them to do that, but still just teach a sort of a core curriculum. And uh, I know you're yep. focused on the, the LVD, but you, you have some other material in there also. Can you talk about how, how you manage the, the specific content um, and yep. the research? Absolutely. So I'm um, just going to 
touch it off there before you give me another question. <laughs> Eric, uh, so managing the content, we definitely have a core syllabus that must be taught um, to a certain set of outcomes. So how they teach it, uh, people have different styles to their teaching and um, we have a series of drills. They choose which one's appropriate for the people that are there on that night and they choose some of their teaching mnemonics and things that suit their style. But ultimately, we're coming out with the same understandings, which is how we feed into our assessment for those grading. So anything that changes that needs to feed into the assessment for the grading. And that's really our blocker point. We can't, we can't have um, students being taught one thing, being assessed on something else. So this right. needs to stay consistent. Uh, do we encourage students to delve into other sources and so forth? Absolutely. Um, usually we don't even have to encourage it, they just do. <laughs> that, that then either feeds into their insight in how they can teach the things that are in the set curriculum and so forth, or um, which is where most of our uh, LVD research and so forth goes. We sometimes get some things uh, in the RADA that directly conflict some of the other things that we want to teach and then that's that vote of, oh, is the school going to go this way or is it not going to go this way or are we going to split it up? Constant contention on various items in there as to what, what becomes part of that core and becomes accessible at the marking points or not. But in the free scholar level, which I haven't really talked about much, but after we've done our offhand weapons, they're free to research and do their own things. So this becomes a group of students that uh, any one of them can volunteer to start teaching something that they're interested in, or they can use their body of students to help them work through something. Like uh, Lois might be reading Gordinio and going, oh, I want to see what this works like. So, We'll run a night, they'll sort of go over the content of the manual and they'll be trying to work out how to put it into a drill and so forth. And um, then that creates little mini syllabuses or mini circuits, which either get used as, um, what do we call them? Uh, event type nights. So once the term ish, we have our special where the whole school trains as one body and we'll be doing something like uh, that's where we fit in Montante or Ron was taking a pole arms class um, not very long ago or we might do a night on Godinho or something else so it's from that free scholar body that they start to do their own research turn it into teachable material and follow it up um, and have people willing and interested to be involved with that and then it's the special classes where we actually do that. Does that get to what you're after? Yeah. So the answer yeah. is both. We, we have that core and then we have the extra flowery stuff on the outside where people get to do their thing. That's good. Um, so I'm gonna stop derailing for a little bit and let you get on with the, the lecture. No, this is great. And like I said, it's normally um, it's normally better to talk about what people are interested in and take it where they want to go. Um, okay, so our next one's inclusivity. I think I've talked about that a lot already. I don't mean just don't be an ass to people that are different to you. That's sort of like the baseline of inclusivity. It means allow people to help when they want to help. Ask them to help if they want to. Don't expect them to help. Just because you're like third or fourth grade or whatever, it doesn't mean that you have to start teaching or that you have to like turn up more often than anybody else or whatever. They're still a student. They still get to control their own uh, involvement and get what they want from the business school. So, yep. And we'll skip over that one. Go to the next one, which is feedback is love, which I um, am really all over. And uh, you can see that. Is it well, and it's fresh out of uni, I think, when she wrote the feedback is love for a teaching technique and knowledge. I think it's very, um, yeah, idealistic and, and fun. Uh, at the end of each term, we hand out paper, simple question paper, 
just like this and that. So, uh, a really easy to mark off how people are feeling and fill in little words here and there. Uh, we also have an online form where they can go and log in and um, type stuff that almost never gets used. Sometimes uh, if somebody's got some feedback that's more like a novel, that'll come through the electronic stage. And these, these forms, as you can see, this is a much larger one for showing on the video, but it's got very little spots to put things in. And sometimes the shorter words uh, create confusions. Like one of them was uh, more swords which to us in our social context, more swords normally means, hey, I want more time fencing and uh, enjoying our sword thing. It's like, great job guys, let's have more of that. But then one of the other admin sort of said, no, oh, actually we were having trouble finding a loner sword the other night. They actually mean we need more swords. So um, that led to a vote from the student body if we wanted to purchase, um, spend the company, the uh, spend businesses funds on more swords for uh, the training school and that went ahead. So that's the other important part of feedback is that you act on it. So I, that doesn't mean that we do it. But yeah. yeah, I, I just, I want to follow up on that uh, because um, you know, I'm connected to a lot of different fencing schools and recently I did see one have issues where um, that feedback uh, mechanism wasn't really well placed wasn't um, wasn't being exercised and and just bad things can happen uh, when something like that's not present I think that's really a, like a valuable insight and if you're listening this to this and thinking about opening your own school uh, that's really critical is to keep the lines of feedback open yeah and exactly like Puck says even if there's no action to be taken we want to acknowledge that we've received that feedback and tell them about that. So in the first, usually the first week after the feedback has come in, we will give broad addressing to the, oh, this feedback is all anonymous in case I've missed that. So we, we don't know the specific person. If we've got more specific questions about it, we might raise it and get it on the next feedback question or um, take it up with the happiness officers to try and see if they can find out what was actually meant. Um, but yeah, Whatever it is, we address it. So like maybe we got feedback that said we should all become Nazis and take over the world. And we'd go, well, we read that. It's a hard no from us. We're not doing that. So um, even, even if you're not doing what the feedback is suggesting, you're letting them see that that's a thing that uh, you've considered. And if we can, we'll give reasons to why the admin team doesn't think that's appropriate. And just in the regular distress away, if uh, those reasons don't hold up, if you break them down and um, they yeah, have no founding in math, then it needs to be overturned and we'll do something different. But, uh, yeah, so always respond to the feedback and uh, act on it when you can. So if they say more swords and that's something that we can do, start that process to see if um, the majority of the school wants more swords and then actually get them. Um, okay, yep. The next part I was going to talk about was assessment, but I think we covered that quite extensively. It's just uh, ensuring that everybody has equal access to assessment. We have clearly stated requirements on, that you must meet before you can assess, and then get to assess, and feedback is there. There's no arbitrary uh, instructor to like this person or um, oh, this person's really good at something else, we should assess them straight away, or, yeah, anyway. So it's just that um, equalness, fairness. Um, which also feeds into our next core value, which is respect. And Respect, uh, it has all the things that we're talking about. So it's like, it's recognize that you know, students are adults that come here to have fun, do their thing. Fencing is just a hobby. And uh, it's, it's not some microcosm of separate world with kings and queens and dominations of, of people. Millions of people, whatever. Um, but it, it's also means Rethinking traditions. So certainly a lot of the assessments that I've 
seen previously have the student and the instructors on different levels. So the assessors might be sitting while the students are standing or vice versa, or the desk that they're assessing on is much higher than, and this, this is like an obvious and natural inequality between the students. And um, the other thing is like, in the assessment, you're after getting the best work out of your student. So if making them nervous is part of the structure of that, then you're not getting the best work out of your student. So uh, very much in this is we have our assessors on the same level. So if the student assessing is sitting, we're sitting. If they're standing, we're standing. Just, um, just keep that visual and obvious equality uh, during the assessment. As well. The other one is neurolinguistics, which is one of my favorite ones. Uh, Hannah put together a course and uh, just a few sheets and things that we run every time that we get a new instructor in. It's just about uh, the word choices that we have and the way that we're teaching. And um, the core of it is getting what we need to say said with as few um, emotional, unintentional emotional consequences as possible. So it's like, uh, one, of, one of the things that I find affects me is uh, rebelling against authority. So like someone says, you do this, I'm going, no. <laughs> um, so it's the way that you can phrase things differently. Uh, an example of that, um, which seems fair enough, I'm sure we've all sort of said something similar. It's like, now let's get this Atajo fixed. So the way that's sort of stated, um, seems okay from a, from a non-emotional point of view, but from the flip side, it can be taken of, oh God, I've been working on this attire for months and now it just needs to be fixed. Everything's wrong with it. What's going on? Why is it here? And really what we're doing is um, we're acknowledging that they've just completed the thing that we were talking on and that's doing really well. So we could say that instead. And uh, even if we just refrain that to, okay, next we need to refine uh, the Atari, which gives us two things. It like feeds on from, you've already finished what it was that you're doing, so acknowledgement of the prior work, and the refinement meaning that uh, what you're doing is probably pretty good. We recognize that you've been working on it and uh, it's a thing, and we can always improve and always refine things. So it's, yeah, it's just that avoiding emotional triggers that um, can make teaching people suddenly very explosive and um, not, not helpful for them. Uh, I think I'm particularly susceptible to those sort of statements. So I notice when they're going on and I'm like really keen for us to adjust them. Sadly, that doesn't always apply to myself. I don't always notice when I'm saying, <laughs> I only notice when somebody else says. So the training is important and you need to have it written down, go through it, work on it like everybody else. Uh, the other thing of respect is to make sure that we're not taking ownership of the student's achievements. So if a student wins a tournament, it's not BISIS that won the tournament. It's uh, they did the work. If they want to thank BISIS for uh, helping them on their journey, that's up to them. So we're very careful with all of our public statements and um, general interactions and congratulations with students do not imply that it's the school's work. It's, it's always the student's work. I mean, the winning a tournament is the easiest one to point out, but that comes up in everywhere all over the place. Uh, when you're instructing a class, you never go, oh, now that I've fixed your Ataro, yeah, no, you didn't do it. They did the work. So um, yeah, just avoiding the instructor taking ownership of the student's achievements or the school. Um, do we have any questions on that one before we move on? Uh, there was something that came up as far as the tournament scene in Australia. Um, how is the school uh, doing in that environment? Do you find that the skills that you're practicing in the school are being effective for you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, shall I delve into that? Okay, so the first thing is it gets a little squidgy because um, People train with a lot of different schools, so they don't always have to stick to the particular syllabus. And um, once again, it's not always the school that causes the win. Me personally, I'm working on distressor constantly and always, so uh, it's a thing that I can do. 
uh, it certainly spiked my tournament performance very highly in the early days. I went from like uh, basically never getting out of first round to um, in the semifinals and um, yeah, still outside. It's still limited by my own ability, which is a problem. I have I have things that I work on and things that I'm suckered into and I don't do enough fitness and all these other things, but none of that I can really blame on the style. So that's really good. Um, and we're getting more and more people coming out and, and doing really well with it. Uh, we had one of our members come second in the Granza Cup and he was uh, fencing the Stroza style as well. So in that section, that, that was really good. And yeah, other than that, like I say, it's kind of hard to point fingers and go, hey, this person's doing the business. But this is probably digging down to that deeper, is the Stroza effective in tournaments? And I think that's a resounding yes. It is. Um, yeah. And certainly nothing from a tournament that I've gone, oh, we definitely can't do that with a Distrezor solution. It's always, yep, that could work. Maybe maybe I'm not the person that can uh, do it right every time. But uh, yeah, there's certainly enough of them to be right. Yeah, one of the things that I've found um, as we work on community building, especially within the Distreza community, is that because this tradition is um, really neglected um, with respect to the wider historical martial arts community, it doesn't get a lot of attention. And as we build that community, we build a base. So um, on your side, I, I've met you and I've met some of the members of your team, and then you've got these up and comers who are doing work. And, and uh, we're gonna have Lois, speaking in this lecture series. I guess I'm spoiling that just a little bit. Um, but when you broaden the base of the membership, um, you bring in a lot of talent. And uh, the tradition can grow in ways that you could never predict. So I think that's one of the things that's really good about the way that your school is set up, is that you can create a broad base of talent and foster people. Um, yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah that's, that's really good. Yeah, and that comes into that free scholar section where people are really able to branch out and do things they want. Um, Ron has really taken off with the montante and the flail, and he's like been really into that and producing lots of good stuff, and also producing flails. So <laughs> he's gotten enthusiastic about the rubble mouldings that make the balls, and now he's making axes and daggers and all sorts of things. And so it's certainly a focal point that. Uh, incubates innovation and, and people to do things, which I, I really love. And I'm really proud that we've got that going on. Um, so the next one is about enjoyment. And this probably builds into what Puck's saying there is like, how do we get all these people to stay around? And it comes down to the social element. We're very social for those that want it. So after every uh, training session, we're either going for a coffee or a ice cream, which is just generally an excuse to stand around and chat. There was certainly a stage where um, we were heading down there after a class and there'd be a large group of us and the ice cream shop would shut and then we're hanging outside the convenience store and suddenly we're the young hooligans that are harassing the convenience store just standing around talking to on or general life and general support. Um, there's other things too, we have the term parties that bring everybody together. Um, so it's just sort of like a bring and play, some place focus and uh, yep. And the other thing that I've found that really helps knit the community and bond people is displays. So we, well me especially, tend to try and sign up for everything that's going on. So uh, cancel council debates and generally things. We try to get in good with our counselors and cross promote um, on their social media. But also it's like, we're there for a half hour display. People have to get there. We're all hanging around together. We're obviously um, separate from the public and yet combined in our own goals. So we're out engaging the public, but we're also bonding as a team and putting on uh, a display. And just about always with these displays, I'm focusing on displaying what it is they'll come learn. 
So we don't want artificial fencing or big flashy things. It's like, show them what it is that we do. They'll be enthusiastic, they'll see it, they'll enjoy it. Um, we also piggyback on any of the reenactor events. There's uh, a big one up here called History Live where we have two days out in the park. And that one, we combine with all the HEMA groups in Brisbane and Gold Coast and put on a big camp and there's like, yeah, lots of people. And we're bringing in the public for have a try lessons and so forth. And I guess that's the other thing with promoting things is it never has to be just about business. So any time that we get a chance to promote things, we're promoting HEMA to the public. It's like, I don't really care if they start swords with our group or with one of the other groups. It's like, first of all, get them picking up a sword and get them playing sword. Similarly, um, you know, if they're training with us and their Wednesday night is busy at uni, we don't like shun them because they've got no Wednesdays and they're gonna go train with, I don't know, long edge doing French. <laughs> um, it's sort of, uh, it's still great that they're in the swords in the community and we get to see these people at these cross events and uh, uh, yeah, all that sort of stuff. Do you um, do any traditional advertising outside from uh, demonstrations and displays? So we have really awesome flyers that we kind of hand out and Sharon's done them up a few different times. I should have had one here to hold up. In fact, if I was on wireless headphones, I could grab one just over there. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, largely we hand them out. That's one of them. Most of the other advertising is through Facebooks. Uh, we've paid for a few ads through Facebook and that's never really returned anything. So um, I, I know some of the other fencing groups had different results, but it's really not been worth it. Our number one um, answer to how did they find us when we come up is always our website is really weird for me to think about because as far as I know the web is dead right it's all social media and social platforms and so forth but um, yeah so a lot of people find us through the website just through googling it so get a website we didn't have one for um, quite a while but yeah and just took a couple of afternoons to get all the content together with I don't know four or five people um, doing that sort of stuff you can be assured that it was not me there is not a word that I've written that's anywhere public because my English is terrible. <laughs> well, maybe not terrible, but it's certainly not my strong point. And uh, I've been assured a few times it's just bad and I hang around with a lot of editors and journalists and so forth, so it feels terrible. Uh, yeah, which was another thing to be honored to be on these talks because you look at any of the other people that I've got coming up or had already and they speak at least two languages and I'm, I'm struggling with my one. So at least I can talk to you what it is that, you know, once again, focusing on what people are good at to keep that there. Any more questions? Uh, not, not right now. Uh, there are questions I'm going to save uh, for the end. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and hmm, I didn't write one of them. I'm just going to keep talking, Puck. At some point, you're going to have to stop me. Uh, so after we launched, uh, lots of things continued with uh, to be just good fortune and fall into perfect place. One of them was Lois starting with us from day one and very quickly becoming enthusiastic enough to start trolling through primary services for us. This, this was amazing and um, something that I never conceived being able to do before she joined in. Um, and the, uh, the other was Puck getting in contact with me going, hey, I'm just running this week long workshop in, in Vancouver. So, uh, you know, we've been running for nearly four months when that came on. So we we're all just like, you know, okay with our content, starting to get a new instructors. And suddenly there's this opportunity to go there and spend 40 hours ish plus a Saturday um, just working on this dresser. And that, that was as amazing as it sounds. And I found that I really do love like get up, do swords, go to dinner, go to sleep, get up, do swords. This, this could be my life, but yeah, anyway, different place. Um, 
Yeah, and also uh, on the back of Lois's notoriety, really, this is, seems to have been put into the more world scene of uh, Distrezza, and we're starting to get contacts all over the place. Uh, it's also been popularized by Kate's developed a bunch of stick figure um, teaching aids that were originally designed to assist with our syllabus, but um, there's been enough people that have been enthusiastic about it that that's now traveling around in the world. Apparently, it's been translated to Russian as well. Which is that something that you guys share publicly? It is now, yep. Um, this is all on our website. Uh, okay. For a while, we we're releasing sections of it as uh, our birthday items, but it just got to a point where it's like, why are we keeping this to ourselves? There's people that say they want to benefit from it. We really need to share this with everybody. So, yeah, we did. And uh, Kate keeps trying to give me credit for it, but it really is her work. She's done so much to get them in and done. And yeah. <laughs> Damn it, I was not reading chat, but Lois is just going, Kate, stick figures are awesome. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I've uh, seen that document and I, I find it, um, first, it's technically really useful because it's pretty well written. Um, but second, it's just charming. Uh, it's, it, it just is fun. It's a really nice way to put just as a forward. The tradition can be so intimidating sometimes um, with the technical jargon that this is really, um, it really disarms that tendency. Yeah, and uh, I'm amazed at how much expression she can get in like three line face. So yeah, it's really cool. Um, yeah, okay. So maybe I'm nearly at the end. The other thing is uh, with our instructors. So we've talked about a bunch of encouraging the different teaching styles. So in our pedagogy, you can see that we're after demonstrating as well as describing the criteria. I'm very big on describing the items that are required uh, and letting people work out where they are. So it's like uh, from above with greater or equal strength subjected such that it can't be struck by a single motion. It's like from this, how do I put it together? What is it that I need to do? Okay, and then we add in, oh, and it needs to encourage their sword to ramp towards your health. Okay, I've sort of got enough to start putting my own learning into this and, and helping the way I develop. Not everybody's like that. There's a lot of people that want to say, here, do it like this. Okay, they learn from that. That's great. And then there's other people that, um, especially once I get to know that's their teaching style, they're going to learn much faster if I go, oh, can I just use your hand for a minute? And I can just put it in the place or roll it through that cut. And then they'll, they'll learn much faster that way. So we encourage diverse teaching styles and uh, diverse teachers too. So a lot of the times um, when we're thinking about instructors and that, my natural instinct is, oh, let's find somebody that teaches like I do. <laughs> but that's kind of the opposite of what has value. It's like, okay, I teach this way. Um, let's find somebody that doesn't teach that way, that teaches more with uh, a theory focus or someone that's more hands-on or someone that has a more contemplative approach. And um, I'm often surprised at how many different teaching styles that we can have and how many different ways the same uh, lesson plan can be taught with different focuses and still have really great outcomes for a lot of their students. On that though, not every instructor works for every student. So when we're selecting a roster or who's on for what week, we have a few simple criteria. And the first one is that we try not to have the same instructor teaching the same class two weeks in a row. So this uh, puts a lot of onerous on us, onerous, uh, on us to make sure that we've communicated between each instructor so they can get that continuity. But it also means that if, if you don't click with the teaching style of one teacher, you're not stuck with them for eight weeks or something like that. It's just like, they'll come back around. There'll be one or two lessons, but then you'll have four with instructors that you're really good with. Or, um, yeah. The other thing is to ensure that the same person is not teaching the same lesson. So I said each lesson has a particular focus. And it's like, if you've got that one instructor that doesn't click with you and they're always teaching, I don't know, expulsions or something, then um, that's 
that's not going to be good for you. So we need to make sure that um, it's not repeated in that sort of way there. How large? Um, finally, oh, sorry. How, so you have a school with about, uh, on the high side of 50 students uh, or 50 members. Uh, how many instructors have you got that service that community? Um, a lot. I don't know, can Kate answer that? She's online, right? Sitting in the chat. No. Um, let me think. So there's me, Kate, uh, Ron, Lois, Eddie, Aiden, Ryan. Must be about eight or ten. And these people won't be teaching all the time because obviously they need to have the class as well. Um, We've just transitioned to having a dedicated beginner instructor. So this is that first night where they intro, come in and, and um, get given a tire and thrust and move on from there. And uh, that's primarily because the person that took it on, basically, she said, I just want to teach beginner stuff. <laughs> and, and it's a godsend for me because scheduling an instructor for every week for when we don't know when any people are going to turn up, um, is challenging. So to have, okay, Sam's on, she's she's running this beginner course is, uh, yeah, it's been great. But we build in the fail safe that she's never teaching two weeks in a row. So she always gets a lesson for herself. So if we got a stream of beginners, like we often do at the start of the year, and it's on every week, then when Sam teaches one week, we'll schedule a different instructor the next week. So just to make sure that we're all getting around. Has anybody come up with the answer to how many instructors I've got? Uh, so Kate is in the chat. Thank you, Kate. She says that you have 11 instructors. Um, so uh, you're doing um, something like, better, I think, better than um, uh, six to one ratio. It's pretty good. And uh, people yeah, are and, uh, impressed about the number of students that you have in the class. Yeah. Um, so 56 members does not mean we get 56 people on a night. and because because we have that drop in and out style, um, it can be big classes one week and uh, two people in your class the next week. But it covers. We have a lot of the instructors to build some depth because instructors have lives too. So they can be not on board for very long times. Speaking of that neuro linguistics, there, there's two things that just triggered me in that last sentence was like, I said, how many instructors I have? And Huck said, you have 11 instructors. And to me, that's like, alarm bells. No, they're not my instructors. I don't own them. They're instructors for BISIC. So they are their own agents and yeah, able to choose to assist and teach and do their own. It's a good example of the language that you're talking about. Um, but you only have about two minutes left. Yeah, I figured. I, I think that actually fit in much better than I thought it would. I thought I had far too much. So, uh, yeah, normally we hang out for a little bit after uh, the hour to uh, do Q&A. Um, so if you are in the chat and you have questions, um, go ahead and type them up, and Eric and I will try to capture them. Um, uh, one of the questions I've got here from the group is, uh, when you started, uh, uh, when the founders started the school, uh, was there any pushback from the other local fencing groups? No. Um, well, um, by and large, the Himu community was very supportive of the new members there. Um, the Wednesday or the week before, I got invited along to the Vanguard um, event and he sort of introduced me and uh, suggested that some of the students that might be interested should come along as well. So that was really supportive, uh, especially as we can flick nights with that school. But anyway, um, and uh, like I said, Henry was uh, more than enthusiastic and there on the open night to help me out. And I think we had members from just about every um, every school, fencing school, in uh, on their opening night. Uh, what were they expecting? How might this pushback have represented? Uh, well, I'm not sure what, what they might be expecting then. 
as but pushback like resistance to or you know i think community politics is one of those things that we all have to worry about oh uh, yeah no doubt there was that but i just don't give it any time so it's basically uh, i'm all about supporting all the groups if they don't want to support my group then it doesn't matter it's not necessarily meaning i won't support their too that's good so um, um a lot go ahead Oh yeah, just, just to finish out that last thing about instructors and so forth, and something that I think is very important is that we peer review our classes. So um, we have uh, some of the people sit in while our instructors are instructing, just to help ensure that we're presenting the right style and help them develop their teaching skills and so forth. And I think uh, Eric was talking about, oh, it's hard to go find a place to learn to teach. And that is, Certainly one of the problems that I've had previously is like you know, often schools will have a grade, I don't know, provost or something and they'll go, okay, by this grade, you've got to be able to teach in this way and this way and this way. And it's like, I didn't learn to teach while I was fencing. What, how, how can I be assessed by something that I'm not taught? So we try to bridge that gap by assisting teaching our instructors in any way that we can. I think that's a really valuable comment, and it kind of goes into my next question, uh, because I think our community is starting to build a lot of talent, and I think there are a lot of us um, who are ready to make that jump into teaching and, and forming a school where people can learn and train. If you had, um, like, what's a brief bit of practical advice, the thing that jumps into your mind as being uh, really important uh, as somebody would go into that, what would you tell them? Um, get help. <laughs> so uh, read about teaching. Don't just assume that what you're doing is right. I mean, you might have seen seen other people teaching. Take on some of that, but make sure that you're reading uh, reliable sources for your teaching as well. I must say that um, continuing with my pup crush, I did try and steal any of his teaching techniques that, that I could pick up and, and remember or carry off well enough. The storytelling, I'm still not quite at, but yeah, there's been a lot of good stuff that I've gotten from watching other instructors. My most um, recent trip to WMAW, uh, I was essentially just surveying the instructors. It was like, how is this person teaching? What is it that they're doing differently? Um, are they fitting into any of the things that I've read as being good? And how do they use these things that sometimes they're just principles or ideas that you get from your teaching manuals? And you go, how does that actually apply to the fences? So. Also, we have a lot of uh, school teachers that are in email. There seems to be heaps of them over here. I'm not sure if that's common everywhere else. But yeah, they should already have a good head start on the, what to teach. It's, Approach it like a class. That's, um, I think that's really a good answer. I want to, because um, I know that Eric had some questions that he had put together as well, so I want to pass off to Eric for a couple of questions. Cool. All right, trying to find the mute button there. Um, yeah, we've actually uh, fit in an awful lot of the questions um, that we had. Um, I, I have a question, Sean, about students who, who leave in terms of your turnover. Do you have a sense of <clears throat> what it is that makes them leave? Is it just they wanted to try something else or do you like reach out them, to them um, afterwards to find out um, you know, if there was something that happened that caused them to leave? Or can you talk about that? I think we all experience a lot of turnover. Yeah, turnover is a big thing. Um, do I reach out to them often, especially ones that I've developed a personal connection with throughout class? Uh, I know Kate and uh, some of the other instructors do too. So it's just, um, we tend to get that social bond while fencing and so forth. So it's, uh, I would say probably rare that people just don't come back and we don't know why. That said, it doesn't quite apply to that first grade. So within that first grade, we still have a high turnover that um, 
some of it goes unsolved. Basically because we don't get to get that social bond enough to be in contact with them and ask them what's going on. Uh, it's not it's not part of our system, but it's normally something that we want to know and uh, keep in touch anyway. The the primary turnovers tend to be people finishing uni. There's so many uni students to manage, and then moving on. Um, getting work shifts on the night that we train that seems to be a big problem to me, and uh, sometimes. Yeah, just general life things. It's, oh, I'm going to be there next week. But it's not ever going to be there next week. They're just too busy. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's certainly something that we think about and look at. And there have been some instances that we've had where we've turned up on a night, we've got an instructor that really didn't click with them to the point that they just didn't come back. So we're certainly aware that's a possibility and we're trying to address that anywhere and anytime. I have another question about um, your, um, your um, students and your, your instructors. How engaged do you feel like they are with their larger community around the world? You know, I know some of you, I'm Facebook friends with some of them. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of people from your school that I, I could come across them in a discussion and, and never knew, never know that they were connected to you in some way. Do you encourage them to get out there and, and talk a lot? Or are there people there that we should be taking? Oh, they're from, uh, they're from BSIS. Um, yeah, like I get it said, never own the student's work, right? If you notice them, that's because you notice them, not because they're from BSIS. Uh, there's quite a lot. I think the social bonding is what then gets them on to be involved. I think uh, just certainly all of our uh, people that have been with us for a while are in the international communities for the various sources and commenting on things. There's one who's got a reputation for just starting internet fights. And he like totally, totally doesn't think he ever does it on purpose. But he's like, I'm just asking them to like tie it to a source, or I just want them to know how it's built from the ground up. And I'm going, good distress of principles, probably bad internet etiquette. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's that's really good. That'd be Aiden Hughes. Let's just get him out there. He he seems to be able to start a fight about nothing, from nowhere, without ever expecting to. So that's kind of eh, plain to fame. It could be a gift. Yeah. So, yeah, and, uh, um, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, there's uh, plenty of other people. Like uh, Ryan's prolific. He trains with just about every group in Brisbane, and he's all over all of the forums. So it's once again, I certainly wouldn't own him as a assist, but um, he, I have a lot to do with him and see a lot of his contributions. To the team. Uh, so I think we're we're winding down just a little bit, um, but um, I have one more question, but before we, we sort of finish up, um, I want to make sure that everybody knows who our next speaker is. That's going to be um, Matthew Howden, and he's going to be talking about uh, Distreza Sabre. So he's got some original research, and he taught some of this material at uh, Vancouver International Swordplay Symposium. It was the last major gathering before the virus really locked everything down. So if you're interested in Distreza Saber, uh, this is a good opportunity to hear what he's been working on. Um, so what, one more question. Um, let's say that you, I want you to pick a Distreza technique that you particularly like just because of its effectiveness. But think about it and uh, tell us what it is so that we can use it to beat you later. <laughs> Puck did send me some of these questions ahead of time, and I'm like, there's so many to choose from. I like them all. There's like the Atar and Cut, and then there's Thrust. But I would have to say that I'm most satisfied when I land a uh, general with an arrow in. So just that nice opposition underneath while controlling out the blade and delivering it in the way. It, it, works, um, it works much better against uh, people that are keen for blade contact, so often not so much against the commons and the vulgars. 
but also it's really great when people are cutting at your legs or charging at you and you can like scoop it up from low and bring it back up and stab them in the chest. So that's that's probably one of my favorites. That is that is a good one. Um, all right, so I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, Sean, thank you so much uh, for talking about your school and uh, the process of putting that together, how you guys work things. I think that's been uh, really valuable. And um, uh, I just appreciate you giving us your time. Yeah, thanks again. And thanks for uh, allowing me to share this thing that um, we've all built together. Really proud of. That's some great stuff, Sean. Thanks for talking about it. You and your whole school. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really great to have uh, your team in the chat fielding questions. That's uh, pretty fun. Um, all right, everybody, I, I really want to thank you for coming and sharing this space with us, and I look forward to next week with Matthew Howden and Estreza Saber. Uh,